text is Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 to 6. The Apostle Paul, writing the letter to the Colossian church, writes, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. It's not easy to know how to talk to God, and it's not easy sometimes to know how to talk to people. Think about talking to God. How do you talk to God? Over the years, I've had many opportunities to hear myself and also others pray. Sometimes I get the feeling that we're really not paying a whole lot of attention to what we're saying or that it becomes cliched or sometimes it's even possible for our prayers to become irreverent. I remember in a former ministry, one of the ushers uh, would always lead in prayer, much like we do here. Uh, the ushers would come forward, and one of the men would come up and pray, lead us in prayer, and then they would receive the offering. Well, that particular Sunday morning, the prayer went something like this. Dear Lord, thank you for this day, and thank you for the food. And then a very long silence, and then a desperate attempt to get out of the situation, something about spiritual food and God's provision. It was a nice try, but everybody knew he blew it. And then he had to turn around and face a smiling congregation and collect their money. As I recall, it was a good offering that Sunday. Um, perhaps we were all feeling well nourished that day. I'm not sure. But um, the point is that sometimes when we pray, it's almost like we kick it into autopilot. And, and we start saying things that are um, familiar and repetitious, not realizing what we are saying until we're in the middle of it, and then we hear ourselves, and then we think, oh, what am I saying? Well, that was the case in this particular situation. Some people, when they pray to God, they change their voice, or they change their vocabulary. Now, that's okay, um, but it's not necessary. If we have valid reasons, that's fine, but it might be just because we never really thought about how to talk to God. A, a wonderful, a godly man uh, of, who's now in, in heaven with the Lord, many of you have read some of his books, uh, A.W. Tozer. Uh, Tozer was the author of A Knowledge of the Holy, which is, if you've never read the book, get it and read it. It's a marvelous book about God's attributes. But Tozer, when, whenever Tozer prayed, he, he always prayed using old English so it would become thee and thou and all of those words and he, he knew that that's not the way we talk and he also knew that when the Bible was written it was written in 1611 uh, the, the King James Bible was first written in 1611 and, and that was the way people spoke so that if we were speaking about you and your we would say thee and thou and so forth but his point was that he felt like that when we talk to God, it should be something special and set apart and different than when we talk to one another. And so he chose to use those terms. That's fine. Um, we may pray differently or we may change the tone of our voice, but keep remembering who we're talking to. We're talking to God, and we need to make sure that we're doing so with a mind that's tuned in on what's going on. For various reasons, I think we struggle talking to God. And we don't do a whole lot better talking to people about God. How do we address each other in discussions about God? So what we're going to do is get fairly practical this morning and explore these matters of talking to God and talking to people about God. And I would suggest to you that if you, if you pay attention to the passage in front of us, that you will discover that Paul speaks, first of all, about how we pray, and then he talks about how we walk in our daily walk in terms of affirming the message of God and then how we speak to others about God. So how we pray, how we walk, and how we speak. Before we begin to look at how we pray, let's, let's pray. 
All right? Let's bow for prayer. Father, we thank you that you are in our midst. By your spirit, you're here, and you know our hearts. You know what's going on in our minds. You know how easily we are distracted and how often we tend to uh, wander. And so I pray that you would help us to hear what you have to say to us through your word. Um, Lord, may I not say anything or do anything that would detract or distract from what you desire to say to us by your spirit through your word. And may we leave here today with a greater consciousness of you, with a better uh, understanding of what it means to talk to you, and may we actually be more diligent in talking to you as well as talking to others about you. Give us grace, we pray in your name. Amen. Let's start with uh, how, we pray, uh, how we pray, and I would suggest that we simply pray with our eyes open. Now, I don't mean that you have to always look up when you're praying, but I'm saying the idea of recognizing what's going on around us, we should, this is how we should pray. We should pray, if our eyes are open in that sense, we should pray with persistence. Paul uses the term here, continually or continue steadfastly. Uh, the root word means to be strong. Literally, it carries the idea of, I, I like this, um, it's actually persisting uh, obstinately. <laughs> If you hang in there and you, real, you, you refuse to give in, you refuse to, you, you just, you know, this is one time in your Christian life where you can be obstinate, okay? You are to pray in that way. You're to persist in that way. As difficult as it is, as it is we just keep on uh, persisting in prayer. That's an attitude. Prayer is hard work. We have to keep at it with bulldog tenacity because our nature is to give up. Paul must remind his readers not to. And so he says, stay on it, stay with it, keep on praying, pray with persistence. Now, there are many other passages that have the same idea. Um, you know them. Uh, Paul told the Thessalonians, pray with what? Without what? Ceasing. All right? Pray about everything, Paul told the Philippians. Always keep on praying for all the saints, he told others. In one passage, he says, be faithful in prayer. Those all speak of persistence. But here Paul adds just a little bit more. He's saying, do this with tenacity. Keep it up. Don't give up. So why should we continue steadfastly? Well, I don't know the complete answer to that question, but I do know that God told us to keep on praying. And if we are to keep our eyes open, we have to pray with concentrated persistence. And so we keep it up. He also says that when we pray, not only are we to stay at it, but also we need to make sure if our eyes are open and praying, we need to be watchful when we pray. Very basically, that means we dare not fall asleep when we pray. The emphasis here is to be alert. Have you ever been praying and found yourself saying things that made absolutely no sense whatsoever? Now, maybe if you pray um, silently, that's not so much of a problem. One of the problems that I have when I pray is that I tend to, I tend to let my thoughts wander. And so I'm praying, and the next thing I know, I'm planning my day. And, and that's a problem. So one of the things that I try to do is I try to pray out loud. Now, that's a little weird, praying out loud when other people are around. So I try to pray when nobody else is around. So sometimes I'll come over here, or sometimes I'm over in the other building, and, and I'll walk around and talk out loud and hope nobody hears me. But anyway, I, I'm praying in that sense. And what does that do? When I'm walking, guess what I'm not doing? Falling asleep. When you fall asleep and you're walking, it's dangerous. So I stay awake, all right? But also, I talk out loud. Do you know why? Because it keeps my mind from wandering, because I also am hearing what I'm saying. And sometimes I'm hearing things, I'm saying, Lord, I'm sorry. I just said something that made no sense whatsoever. And if it doesn't make any sense to me, I mean, that's pretty bad when I'm the one who's praying. So we need to be careful how we pray, and that's one of the ways we can stay alert. And Paul said when we pray, we need to be watchful. Whatever works for you, that's good that you're alert, that you're aware of what you're saying. Um, that was what the problem with my usher. He just was, he was in a different mode. He was thinking something different, and then what he said ended up being distracting. We have to be watchful because of the distractions, and there are distractions everywhere. 
there are pressures, there are problems, we have plans, we're making those kinds of things, we have certain things that we're going through our mind in regard to programs or purposes. So many things can capture our attention and they distract us from talking to our Heavenly Father. How many times have you, have you started to pray and, and you really did uh, begin to rehearse what you're going to do for the day? Um, and it starts out, sometimes when people pray, I'm not exactly sure if they're talking to God or if they're talking to other people. Sometimes we're guilty of that when we pray publicly. So it sounds almost like we're talking to the congregation, not really to God. And it can get really um, strange. Um, one time, and I don't remember who it was, and I'm glad I don't remember, but um, I was at Moody Bible Institute in the middle of Founders Week. And one of the people who was leading the, the group that day, it wasn't one of the, the main speakers, but he came up and, and he was sharing some things. He said, let's pray. And apparently while he was praying, somebody handed him a note. And so in the middle of his prayer, he said something like, dear God, and let the person whose license plate is blah, 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 that their lights are on. Not a good way to give announcements, okay? And what that did was, it might have been comical, but it was demeaning what we're doing in terms of really talking to God. So we have to be careful, I think, what we're doing. That's part of being alert. We need to be watchful not only because of the distractions, but also because of the dangers. The Apostle Peter wrote, casting all your anxieties or all your cares on him. Why? Because he cares for you. And then right after that, he makes the point that not only does God care for us and therefore we can cast all of our cares, when we cast our cares upon him, what are we doing? We're really talking to him, we're praying, we're, we're giving him those things. But then right immediately after that, he says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. It's possible for the enemy to devour you not by destroying you, but sometimes distracting you. We think, when we think lion, we think of, you know, we think of, we think of something that's going to bring great damage to us when he is also one who can distract us and move us away from what's important. And so we are to cast our cares upon him because he cares for us and we're not to be distracted by the enemy who will try to somehow devour us or destroy us, whether that's with outward problems or inward thoughts. And so he says, resist him, firm in your or resist him, firm in your faith. How do we do that? By being undistracted and by recognizing the potential danger. One of the ways the enemy devours us is to overwhelm us with the cares of life. He piles them on, and then we try to carry them instead of giving them over to Jesus. The enemy is always nearby, so we have to be on guard. Remember the Old Testament story of Nehemiah? It's, it's fascinating. They were building a wall around Jerusalem. It had been all torn down as a result of enemies uh, burning the city. And now Nehemiah leads a group of people, and they're going to build the wall around the city of Jerusalem again. And so he's helping the people get, get going, but there were enemies who were trying to stop the progress. If you think about that, now it actually happened, but also it's an illustration of as, as we begin to build the defenses around our own lives, there are people who are trying to take those down, and the enemy's trying to take those down. So Nehemiah told his people, basically, you have a trowel in one hand, and what in the other hand? A weapon. So that you are ready to build, but you're also ready to defend. And sometimes in prayer, it's like that. We are praying, but we're also recognizing there's an enemy, and we have to be um, prepared to fend off that one that would cause us to be distracted. It's a dangerous thing to pray. When Paul talked about praying to the Ephesians, that's that passage where he said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And then he talks about putting on the armor, and then he immediately talks about prayer. It's a dangerous thing to pray. I think it was Warren Wiersbe who said, if there is no fire on the altar, the incense will not rise to God. Routine prayers are unanswered prayers. Ouch. The idea that I'm talking to a holy God and raising up my concerns and my desires and my praise and all the rest up to him, there ought to be a level of fervency there. 
if there's no fire on the altar, they don't rise up to God. Maybe there's something to what he has to say there. If we're not watchful, we will not see the danger. If we see the danger, we will pray more fervently to the Lord who is able to guard us and deliver us. So we pray in that way. We also pray with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving ought to permeate our praying. Are we thankful? Number one, and do we express it? Number two, in Paul's writing to the Colossians, he expressed thankfulness for several things. In chapter one, he thanked God for salvation. In chapter two, he thanked God for spiritual growth. In chapter three, he thanked God for fellowship with Christ and for fellowship with other people who know Christ and for the privilege to serve Christ. In chapter four, he thanked God for answered prayer. We can be thankful to God for a number of reasons, certainly for his presence, certainly for his provision, absolutely for his pardon, and for his promises. All those things are reasons to give God thanks. That's how we are to pray. For the believer not to be thankful reveals some very serious heart issues. When, um, when you do something nice for somebody, a kind to somebody, why do you do that? Hopefully your, your motive is right because you just want to do something nice to them. If they don't say anything, how do you feel about that? Now, that doesn't mean that they're being necessarily unkind, and we're not really doing it for the praise, but there's something about appreciation that's appreciated, right? I mean, when we do something for somebody and they, and they say, thank you so much for doing that, that we, we, we feel appreciated. We, we feel good about that. That's not saying that our, our motive was simply to get some kind of praise from men, but we feel good when people see that as something kind offered to them. Now, I'm not saying that we're like God in that sense, but God has done all these things for us, and his expression, uh, or his desire for us is to express our praise to him. And when we don't, there's something wrong with that picture. You recall the time that Jesus told the story about the ten lepers. I mean, here were ten people who had this horrible disease, and what that meant was that they were going to slowly gradually lose feeling in the extremities of their body and eventually those would no longer have circulation would literally drop off and ultimately they would die not to mention the fact that that was a very um, contagious disease and so they had to be separated from other people now you can imagine going through life knowing that you have this horrible disease that keeps you away from everyone and is leading to a slow death. And Jesus comes along and he heals these ten people. Now, I'm pretty certain that all ten of them were grateful to God for healing them. I mean, why wouldn't they be? But only one came back and said, thank you. Interesting. And so Jesus asked the question, where are the other nine? So here we are. People who are dead in our sin, who are lost, who are undone, and God pardons us. He forgives us. He cleanses us. He's with us every day. He works with us. He is our paraclete, our advocate. All those things. And what's our response to that? For the believer not to be thankful, that's an indication of something wrong somewhere. All right, so... Basically, what I'm trying to say is that we are to pray with our eyes open. And how we should pray, we pray with persistence, we pray with watchfulness, we pray with thanksgiving. Well, then, for what do we pray? Now, this is just one passage on prayer, and there are many passages in the Bible on prayer. And there are a lot of different things that the Bible talks about in terms of how we should pray and for what we should pray. But here we have a clear statement concerning for what we ought to pray. Paul's request was centered on his desire for people to see and know Christ. And that should be true of us as well. Part of the issue of our praying ought to be that God might uh, use us in such a way that people might see the Lord in us. And so as Paul is asking for prayer, the first thing he asked for is he prayed for an open door. Specifically, one that God himself would open to him and his co-workers for the word. 
especially one that God himself would, would, uh, would do, or the opportunity was needed so that the message could be delivered. Now, do we pray for those opportunities for the word? Think about it. Tomorrow morning, for many of you who go off to work, if, if one of your prayers was similar to what the Apostle Paul said when he said in chapter um, 4, verse 2, or verse 3, at the same time, pray also for us that God may open for, to us a door for the word. If that was one of the things that I asked God to do, then what do you suppose I'm going to be looking for all day? As if that's really a genuine concern in my heart, then I'm going to be looking for those windows or doors of opportunity to share about the Word of God to the people that I'm around. I've just asked God to do that. I'm going to be paying attention for that. Now, what's interesting is when we don't have that as a desire, we won't have that as a prayer, and we probably, even if those opportunities make themselves available, we probably won't see them. We're not looking for them. Sometimes God opens the door so wide we can't miss it <laughs> when, when we have opportunity to speak for Christ. As you're, you're at work or you're um, somewhere in the community or neighborhood or whatever and somebody says to you, you know, I hear that you know Christ and I'm really struggling in my life and could you tell me something about Jesus? Well, I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> well, why not? I mean, we're praying for open doors. Why, why, why would we be surprised by that? unless we're not looking for that. Secondly, Paul prayed for an open mouth. What, what do we do with the opportunities that come? It's, again, it's costly to pray because God may open those opportunities. And then what do you say when they're in front of you? Um, Paul opened his mouth to proclaim the mystery of Christ. And what happened to Paul? He was thrown in prison. And he ends up in prison, or he's chained to a Roman soldier, and um, what's he do now? I mean, we would look at that as, boy, that took care of his ministry. It's over now. He can't go out and preach anymore. But it didn't close his mouth. It simply limited his audience. But it also kept his audience from running away. <laughs> they were chained to him. Paul could say, let me tell you about Jesus. What's he going to say? Now, he could tell Paul to shut up, but Paul was engaging and able to talk, and, and he was always looking for a way to tell people about Jesus. The, the book of Philippians tells us that he had managed to tell many of these guards about the Lord Jesus, and the result was that the whole praetorian guard, the whole, count, the whole, the whole of Caesar's household, was impacted by the grace of God, by the working of God, by the message of God, by the gospel of God, because Paul was chained to Roman soldiers and told them about Christ, and many of them believed. Now, when would Paul have had an opportunity to share the gospel to the household of Caesar? It would not have likely happened. But God simply made it work. And he used all that for his own purposes. God opened the door, and Paul had to open his mouth. Third, Paul prayed for an open message. Pray that when we speak, the message will be clear. The Spirit of God is able to open closed hearts and minds. Do you know anybody at work or in the neighborhood or maybe in your family who is totally closed to the message of Christ? Sure you do. If you say something, hey, I'd like to tell you something about my faith in Jesus, they're going to tell you, I don't want to hear. I don't want to hear anymore. What we're asking God to do is to open people's minds and hearts to be able to hear the gospel and respond to the message of Christ. That's what we're asking God to do. Now, is God able to transform people's hearts and minds? He did yours. And, and you, even if you were a child, at one point, you had a mind hard as nails against God. You didn't care about God. You weren't interested in God. You were shut. The door was shut. And somehow the message of Christ penetrated your heart. And you heard, finally, for the first time, God opened your mind. He you opened your heart. You believed the gospel. And now you belong to Jesus. He did that. Now, if, that, if there's a God in heaven who's able to open your heart and mind to believe the gospel, then there is a God in heaven who is able to open the hearts and minds of people to get them to listen to the message of the gospel. 
and so you share. Now, that doesn't mean you'd be obnoxious if they tell you, don't tell me. I don't want to hear. You don't keep forcing the issue, but you keep living your life in front of them, and every time the opportunity comes, you tell them about Jesus. One of the problems we have in the evangelical church is that we don't tell people about Jesus. We just don't. We, we live in neighborhoods. We live in families. We, we work in places, and, and we simply don't talk about Jesus. We talk about the Bears. We talk about the Packers. We talk about... We don't talk about the Cubs. We talk about other things, all kinds of things. We talk about sports. We talk about the weather. We talk about family relationships. But we don't talk about Jesus. Where in the world are these people going to hear? My, my understanding is that um, the church of Jesus Christ, the reason why we come here to Lakeview Church primarily is focused on God. We worship Him. We get instructed and encouraged to worship God. Then where is evangelism to take place? Out there. So when you go to work, out there. When you're in your neighborhood, out there. When you're in your home, it's out there. There's where the message of Christ is, is demonstrated and, and articulated and people hear the gospel and then they trust Christ and then they come to worship this great God who saved their soul. Now, the church can be an evangelism center and many churches are, but I don't think that's God's intentional design. His design is that we come together for worship and we scatter for evangelism. It's a picture of Acts. That's what the people did. So Paul's praying for an open message. My assignment is to make the message clear, and God will open the hearts and minds of people to apply the message in their heart. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting the, the spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. What they need is a spiritual heart, and only God can supply that. But when he does, then it makes sense. So pray with your eyes open. All right, secondly, we need to pray, or we need to walk with our mind open. If we're praying as we ought, then we're going to have some opportunities. What are we going to do with those? Well, Paul's prayer was to make making opportunities by the way we act. We need to be very wise in the way we act toward those outside. And Paul's referring to those outside of Jesus Christ. We meet them every day. We see people that we don't know. But they know us well enough to know that we, we know Christ. And they're waiting and watching to see what we're going to do. In the early days in the church, uh, in the first century, do you know what they called Christians? I mean, Christian was actually a name for, of derision. You little Christs. And the Christian said, whoa, we like that. <laughs> that's not a mocking name. That's a wonderful name. Um, so they got a, another name for Christians. They called them atheists. Did you know that? They called them atheists. You know why? Because in the Roman world, they had all kinds of gods. And how many, how many gods does a Christian worship? One. They thought, you guys have one god, man. We got thousands of them. You a bunch of atheists. And then another reason they called them atheists is because the, the unbelievers in the Roman world all bowed down to the Caesar. The believer didn't do that. And then another reason why they, they called them, they not only called them uh, uh, atheists, but they called them unpatriotic. They also called them um, immoral. Because a lot of times the Christians would gather, and, and in order for protection not to be persecuted, they would meet behind closed doors. They would meet in locked rooms. And so the outside world said, something creepy is going on in there. There are a bunch of immoral dudes there. And so the Christians were fighting titles like atheist and unpatriotic and immoral. And they were simply trying to do the will of God. And Paul is saying, how you walk, how you walk is important. Because when they see you, rumor may say, this is what you're like. But when I see you, your actions don't say that. And then they ask more about the Lord Jesus. Making the most of opportunities that we make. If we talk to God and to others the way we ought, the opportunities will be there. Our responsibility is to make the most of the opportunities. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 13, this, this is an interesting statement. He said, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. 
The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime. Now there's a lot there, but at least one of the things he's reminding us is it's now to make the message known. It's not some other time, it's now. While we need to exercise wisdom in the way we approach opportunities, normally when they come, we're called to take them. Finally, Paul says in verse 6 that we're to speak with our ears open. Here's what he says in verse 6. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. We should be speaking with gracious speech. We've been saved by grace. We live by grace. We ought to speak with grace. Our, our mouths ought not to be characterized by such things as others who do not know the grace of God. For example, we shouldn't be uh, known for our cursing or deceit or vanity or foolishness or babble or idle talk or boasting or gossip. Those things don't have a place in our lives. Our words should be marked by the qualities that are developing in our relationship with Christ. What, what are some values, what are some characteristics or qualities that should permeate the way we talk? I think of um, um, Paul's words about the fruit of the Spirit. What are they? Love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control, those kinds of things. That ought to permeate our speaking because if Christ is working in us, those things should be flowing out of us. When the other stuff is flowing out of us, there's a problem. Paul, uh, Jesus actually mentioned and Paul affirms that um, what's in the heart, what's in our, our brain, what's in our, what's in our innermost part of us and our mouth are connected. So just think of it this way. Your, your, your mouth and your heart are wired. Okay? They're together. So what's in your heart comes out of your mouth. Um, usually when we are, sometimes we put up our guard and we're okay for a while, but when we're unguarded moments, words come out that probably really say what's in our heart. Uh, boy, that's happened so many times. Watching other people do it, but also in my own mind and heart, um, you're going along and you're working on something and you hit your finger with a hammer. What do you say? Bless the Lord, oh my soul. <laughs> Maybe. Um, sometimes something else comes out. Now, how did it get out? Well, it must have been there. <laughs> and so sometimes what is in our mind and our heart comes out our mouth and we have to be careful and when stuff starts coming out our mouth that's not appropriate maybe it's time to say God I've got some problems in my heart and I need to clean that up I need you to clean that up we speak with our ears open we're supposed to speak with seasoned speech what does that mean when the Bible talks about seasoned with salt what does that mean I think it has something to do when, when you think of salt what do you think of taste probably I think also the Bible used it to talk about purity and preservation all those things are true with salt the Jews sometimes offered salt to their sacrifices so was Paul suggesting that we treat our speech as a sacrifice to God actually it could be in uh, Hebrews it says through him then let us continue to offer up the sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of the lips, acknowledging his name. That's certainly appropriate. When the Greeks talked about speech being filled with grace, seasoned with salt, they were suggesting that such speech was be filled with charm and with wit. Is that how we speak to others? Think of it this way. You are proclaiming the message of Christ, but in less than appropriate, inappropriate manner. The question on the hearer's mind would be, I know that you claim to well, I know what you claim to believe about Christ, but why is your speech so out of character with your claims? And so, if we're walk, if we're talking with a um, with words filled with grace, then what we say matches what we claim in our hearts. If we fail to speak with grace, then those hearing are turned off. And sometimes I think that we assume that what we say, we're saying, oh yeah, we tried to share the gospel with them, but they were, they were just turned off and they, and they left. 
Sometimes they're turned off by what we say, not by the message. Sometimes they're turned off by our method, not by our message. Now, they'll probably reject the message, too. But let's not, our, let's not allow our, our method and our words to push them away. All right, let's wrap all this together. Maybe you're looking at this and you go, okay, um, I know what Paul said. He told me to pray. He told me how to pray, what to pray. He told me how to talk to others. He told me how to do this, but I don't know if I'm doing that very well. I'm not sure that I'm really really making an inroad into uh, in my prayer life. I, th I think I'm struggling a little bit. How do you fix those things when you're not doing it right? What do you do? A good place to start is to talk to God. I'm not doing this well. I need some help. Maybe you talk to somebody else and say, would you pray for me that I would be able to really understand what it means to talk to God? And If we can help you, I'm, I'm not an expert on prayer. But I can tell you what I've learned from the Bible and what my own life has been. If you have some questions, talk to me. Talk to Pastor Jim. Talk to one of our deacons. Um, talk to a Sunday school teacher. Talk to um, one of the people sitting around you. And if they say, I don't know, then, <laughs> then let them come and, and we'll talk together about what it means to, to pray in this way. Talking to God and talking to others about God. It's a big deal for the Christian. If you do not pray to God, there's something wrong with your relationship to God. And if you don't speak to others about God, there's something wrong with your relationship with God. And most of us, there's something wrong with our relationship with God. We have some work to do. And so we ask God to help us. And so what I'm going to do is just simply pray, ask God to help us now. You pray along with me, and then we're going to sing a song and, and go downstairs and eat. But I want you to think about this whole matter of prayer. What did Paul say? What is he saying? Be watchful with thanksgiving. Keep on doing it. Keep on speaking about Christ. Keep on making sure your speech is right. Do that for the glory of Christ and for the good of his name. Let's talk to him. Father, thank you that you hear us and you know our hearts cry even now. Uh, for some in this congregation, we're, we're we're asking you to help us to be, to be more in tune with you when we're praying, to, to, to be more honest when we pray, to, to be more persistent when we pray, to be more believing when we pray, to realize that you really are the one who can answer our requests and, and help us to walk with you. You're, you're the God who can answer those things. We thank you for that. We thank you that you're a God who can cleanse us where we're not clean. And you can reprogram uh, our minds and hearts where we're offline. And you can give us grace and you can pardon us where we need it. I pray that we'll become a praying church. Wherever we are now, may it get better. May it improve. May we be known for our desire to love you, serve you, thank you, praise you, worship you, to glorify you, and talk about you. Please help us. We pray that you'll guide us and give us grace even as we think through these concepts as we sing together. And for the glory of Christ and for the good of your church, we thank you in your name.